the rain started to fall. That wasn't going to stop me. I grew up in between eras. When I was in Little League, not everybody got a trophy, but by the time I made it to middle school, they told us you could be whatever you wanted to be. That is a lie. <laughs> I wanted to be a basketball player. I am six feet tall. I am slow. I am white, and I can't shoot. If you look at the NBA roster, there's exactly zero of me on any of the 30 teams. But I was in middle school, and I was going to work at it. I've always hated Michael Jordan. You got to understand, I grew up in Northeast Ohio. And instead of knowing names like Bill Cartwright and Luke Longley, you should know names like Mark Price and Craig Elo and John Hot Rod Williams and Brad Doherty. But you right now are saying, who are these people? You don't know because the Cavs never won anything because of stinking Michael Jordan. <laughs> so as I was in my driveway, I was Magic Johnson. And we were redoing the 91 finals. Gone would be that highlight where you saw Jordan switch hands in midair and lay the ball up, and it makes me sick to this day. <laughs> Gone would be that. And instead, the Magic Johnson that I was in the driveway, as the rain was falling even more and more, was going to send the Chicago Bulls back home weeping that they had just lost. The rain picked up. Every shot that I took as the Lakers would hit the wind. When I'd shoot the ball as the Bulls, the wind would stop, and I'd hit the shots of the team I didn't even want to hit the shots for. You've got to understand, I've always been a tortured individual. And there I was in my driveway in a pretend basketball game, shooting as the team I didn't want to score, scoring. I was getting frustrated, but I was not going to be deterred. So then the Lakers started getting fouled a lot more, and then they just started shooting free throws. It's like if you watch a game now, the Golden State Warriors, you sneeze on them, that's a foul. They mug somebody, no foul. Get ready for it, Bucks fans. I'm just telling you, get ready for it. It's gonna, you're gonna be really upset in June. It's coming. My mom opened the front door, said, come on in. Said, I'll be in in a minute. The rain, it picked up, but it just felt like sweat pouring from my brow. I would be undeterred. The sky started to turn a shade of green like I had never seen before, but I kept shooting. A couple minutes later, my mom came to the door and she yelled, Brian! And at that moment, I picked up my dribble and did a fadeaway. You can't ever be rattled by the fans. Never let the fans get in your head. <laughs> I missed the shot. She said, you need to come in right now. So I picked up my basketball. I went inside. I went to the fridge, and I grabbed a Gatorade, not because I wanted to be like Mike, but I just really liked Gatorade. <laughs> and then we went downstairs in the basement. And I looked at my mom and I said, do you think Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson's mothers would make them stop practicing because of a little rain? And she just looked at me and said, honey, one night of practice isn't going to prevent you from being Magic Johnson or Michael Jordan. <laughs> I remember this vividly because that's the night a tornado touched down just a couple miles from our house. Remember this conversation. We are inundated with products that promise us the potential to be better. Whether it's the old Gatorade ad campaign that promised us that we could be like Mike. What, whatever it is, much of what we're presented in life comes with the promise to enhance our lives. And yet much of it falls short. But the thing that all of these things reveal is within most of us is this desire, dare I say, within all of us is this desire to be better. And so sometimes we seek out a product or a routine or a regimen in order to become better. More often than not, however, we see little change. We accept that fact and we either give up or we try something else entirely in hopes that this time, maybe, it would be different. Here's the reality for those of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus with our lives. We have been called to change. 
And so over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to look at a, at a book in the New Testament called Titus. And it's a book that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young guy that he'd partnered with in advancing the story of Jesus across the region. And then he was imparting wisdom in this younger guy named Titus. Paul and Titus, they began working together on Crete. And Titus stayed behind as Paul left to continue the work that they had done. And then Titus starts with just some introductory remarks from Paul to Titus. And then we're going to dive in in Titus 1.5. If you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there. And if not, the words will be available on the screen. But this is what we see. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so here Paul's pulling back the curtain a little bit. This is the backstage segment. He's telling Titus, I need you to be there so that you can put elders in place to help the machine of the church move forward. We are a lot of things. We are a lot of things. But make no mistake about it. Everything that you see doesn't just happen organically, and it was never designed that way. Yes, there's supposed to be community, and yes, that we're invested in one another's lives, but there is a machine that has run things in churches from the very start. And I know sometimes right now, because we've seen abuses and excess in some places, that's kind of a a dirty word or a dirty thought, but the reality is there has always been a machine that's running the mission. And there has to be a machine that runs the mission so that the mission can be more focused and more successful. That's the entire point and the entire purpose. You want to have a mission, and then you want to have as much success with that mission as you can. Why? Because we're in the business of changing people's not only lives, but their eternities. We're in the business of introducing hope and love and peace and joy to a world that so desperately needs it. And so we have to understand that this isn't some dirty idea that there are these elders in place who are running the machine. No, the machine's in place so that the mission can be more successful. And just because there have been some high-profile just examples of excess and abuse doesn't mean that you just throw out the whole model. So understand that it was always designed this way, that there was always to be a machine behind the mission. Because that way the mission can go further and have more success. And then he says, here are the people that you need to have running that machine. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So stop right there. He says, when you're looking for people to run the machine that is the church, so that you can have the greatest impact on your mission, here's who you need to find. Here's who you need to find. You need to find people that there are no glaring weaknesses in their life, that when you look at their life, there is not a habitual pattern of them falling short time and time again in in this area. That when you look at them, they're not perfect because none of us are, but you look at them and you say, yeah, they've got a good reputation. I feel pretty good about that person. And they're not habitually making the same mistake over and over and over again. And the big one of the biggest tests for this is the family dynamic. And so he says, make sure that the person is a family man. That's a test. Because oftentimes what happens is people will sacrifice their families. And he says, this needs to be your biggest priority. Make sure that you are fighting for your family. Make sure that you are shortchanging everything else before you shortchange your family. Make sure that this person is somebody who has their priorities right. Make sure that he's a family man. You've got to understand the early church, they they were all house churches, and so there's no hiding this in the community. Everybody in the community knows the answer to this. Everybody knows whether or not you're living up to that standard. And yet, here's the interesting thing. While everybody will know it eventually, your family will know it first. Moms and dads, don't shortchange your family. 
You are going to have to make some choices. You are going to have to make some decisions in life. And you just need to choose right now that it will never, ever be at the expense of your family. That it will never be at the expense of your relationship with your spouse. That needs to come first. And then you will never shortchange your kids. The reality is this. Your job will exist without you, and it will go on. Your family won't. Choose today and make the commitment that you are going to be a family man or a family woman, and that is going to be your priority. Above everything else, eventually everyone will find out, but your family will find out first. And if you sacrifice your family, it doesn't matter what you achieve. You've missed the most important thing. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. And there we go back to this idea, above reproach. Again, not perfect, but no glaring imperfections. No glaring areas of their life that they're habitually imperfect in. He must not be arrogant, or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain. Make sure that the people who are running the machine of the church are humble and even-keeled, that they're sober, that they're nonviolent, and that they're not obsessed with money. And when we look at our culture, what we see so often that is celebrated is the exact opposite of this. And so this is a call for us, for those of us who follow Jesus, to be countercultural in that regard, that we make sure that we set the tone, that we make sure that we are humble people, that we are even keeled, that not too much gets us to, to overreact. Guard your overreactions. Guard your overreactions. Every time I've guarded my overreactions, and I'm somebody who wants on the surface, I want to I react instantaneously. Every time I've done that, I've regretted it. And I've been a jerk. Every single time somebody has done something that has made me angry, and I've wanted to respond in the instant, I've been a jerk and I've regretted it. Every time. Every time I've taken some time to catch my breath, to think about it, to run it past my wife, to hear her advice, to say, no, I don't agree with that advice, to have her say, no, you need to agree with that advice, for me to say, no, I still don't agree with that advice, and this is what I'm going to do. And then right before, before I pull the trigger, say, maybe I should listen to her, and then I do decide to listen to her, and then I take another day to think about it, and then I respond, never regretted it. Not once. Guard your overreactions. I promise you, You may not like it in the minute, but that feeling that you have that if you just set somebody on fire, it will feel good for about an hour. But then there's a very real cost. And if you take the time and you guard your overreactions, you will not regret it in the long term. Somebody that's sober, somebody that that doesn't get drunk, somebody who's nonviolent, And somebody who's not obsessed with money, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined, willing to give to others, loves what's good. These need to be the defining characteristics of the people who run the machine to make sure that the mission is the most successful that it can possibly be. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. He needs to be somebody who understands scripture and who loves scripture and who's well versed in it and who understands it so that when there are new ideas that they have a filter and they have a lens to go through. This is who elders should be. This is is what they should be. And not just elders, but this is what all of us should strive to be. That all of us would say that we want to live our lives and conduct our lives in a way that when people look at our lives, there are no glaring areas of imperfection that we are habitually guilty of. That when people look at us, they see that we're passionate about our work, but our greatest passion is not our job. Our greatest passion is our spouse and our kids and our family. 
that people would look at us and they would see that we're not somebody who overreacts, but instead that we guard our, re- our reactions. That we're, we're not somebody who's always in it for ourselves, that we don't elevate finances above everything else and find all of our worth and what our bank account is, that we're disciplined in our finances, and yet we understand that there is something so much greater than money that this world has to offer. We understand that we are people who are not ready and eager to look for a fight, but we are people who are nonviolent, and we seek to find another resolution. That is what we need to be. That is who we need to strive to be. That is what the elders must be, but that is what all of us should want to be. And if we are willing to go through this process, then our lives will be enhanced. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy road. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be fun. But what it does mean is it will lead us on a path to the most peace and the most fulfillment that our lives could could possibly offer us. A life lived in pursuit of Jesus will never leave you with regret. Ever. And some of you right now, you have a choice to make. And the question is, what will be your primary pursuit? And I promise you, I guarantee you this, if your primary pursuit, if you will let it be something where you say, my primary pursuit will be a life that is led, striving to become more like Jesus, you will not leave this world with a single regret. The choice is yours. That's who elders have to be. They have to be. Every time that somebody falls short of this, and you say, yeah, bring them on, help them, help them run the machine. You are inviting danger within the church, and then the mission, the mission suffers invariably every single time. And all we have to do, unfortunately, is, is Google church right now. That's all we have to do. And we see example after example where the machine went wrong and now the mission suffers or maybe the mission is dead because the machine got it wrong. The stakes are high. The stakes are high. But we have to make sure that the machine is operating accordingly so that the mission can have the most success because again we're in the business of seeing lives changed now we we have elders here at lakeside and we're going to introduce something on may 29th that is is not for most of you it's not for most of you Uh, most of you would would be really bored by this but we're starting something it's called off the record and what this is it's just going to be a night of honest conversation about an hour and a half to two hours worth of theological discussion. If you're like, I'm out, I don't blame you, all right? I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, a dork in some regards. Like I'm, I'm like, yeah, let's talk theology for a couple hours. And most people are like, nah, I'm good. And that's okay. That's, that's totally fine. But we are all, we're going to be talking for a couple hours about our approach to eldership here at Lakeside. And so I know some of you have questions or, or thoughts on this, and, and this, is, this is what we're going to be talking about that night. We come from a more of a complementarian angle than more of an egalitarian angle. We're going to talk about that with people. We're not angry at anybody who, who looks at things differently than we do. Uh, we're going to talk about and address why that is. Uh, we're going to talk about the strengths of that argument, the weaknesses of that argument, the strengths of the other argument, the weaknesses of the other argument, some of the, some of the intricate details of this. Some people think that if you've ever been divorced, you're not eligible to be an elder. Some people think that that's not at all what this pat. We're going to talk about all of that. So if that interests you, what we need you to do is sign up. We're going to feed you dinner, and we're going to talk theology for an hour and a half to two hours. If you're like, all pass, great. That's why we're not doing it on a Sunday morning. But there's only 15 spots. There's only 15 spots available. So if that's something that you want to participate in, it's, it's free, and it's available to you. You need to sign up. There's a link in the Bible app, or there's now a link on our website at lakeside-church.com. You can sign up there, and once the registrations are full, uh, we'll let you know. Or if they're not full, that's fine, and nobody wants to do it. I'll just come talk theology to myself for an hour and a half to two hours and uh, eat a sub for one. That'll be fun. Um, so we've talked, about, we've talked about who we all want to strive to be, and now we're going to see who not to be. And we all know examples in our lives of who not to be. 
I was at the I was at the gym a couple days ago, and shut up, I do cardio, all right? I know you're looking at my arms right. I, you're looking at my arms, and you're like, yeah, he was at the gym the other day. It was cardio, all right? I do cardio, I'm not a lifter. I do cardio, thanks. Uh, <laughs> literally, in the Y, on the treadmill, 13 open treadmills in the, in the fitness center. Gentleman comes in, gets on the treadmill right next to mine, starts talking on his phone. He's got the earbuds in with the little microphone right there, starts talking on his phone, and apparently the gentleman was hard of hearing a little bit, and I'm not angry at anybody who's hard of hearing, but apparently felt the need to shout into the microphone, unsure that the microphone would actually pick up what he's wanting to do. Sitting there, going like this, I, I can't... I, I can't say for sure, but it just felt like I'm getting sprayed with his sweat while I am just looking at him and then looking at all 13 other empty treadmills that this gentleman could have picked in the fitness center. Don't be that guy. Just don't be that guy. Now, we all have examples when we know you don't, you don't want to be that guy. And now what, what Paul's going to do is he says, here's who you don't want to be. This is the equivalent of the guy who gets on the treadmill right next to you at the YMCA when there's 13 other empty treadmills that he could have gotten on. Here's the example of that. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not teach. Here's the deal. It's easier to be this guy than just the guy we talked about earlier. It's easier to be this guy, but don't be this guy. He won't listen. He won't cooperate. He's a talker, but there's no follow through. We all know people like that. As soon as you hear this description, you've got at least one, but probably a couple people in mind. Well, yeah, that's this guy. You know exactly who these people are. You can't tell them anything. They won't listen to anyone. They're uncooperative. They're the person when they go to an amusement park, they're just, they think that the line policy doesn't apply to them. You just, you know exactly who this person is. You never want this person as a neighbor. They are the worst neighbor ever. There's no follow through. They have all these grand ideas that, that they bring up, and yet they never do anything to follow through with them, and yet they always tell you how you need to implement all of their grand ideas, but they never do anything to better anything else, and they lead people astray. Now, we're not going to dive too deep into this, but you just need to understand there were some Jewish sects who were teaching you had to be circumcised to follow Jesus. And so when he says that there's people who are upsetting people from the circumcision party, upsetting whole families, you think? Like 35-year-old men who want to follow Jesus, now they're like, yeah, but first you need a little snip. And they're like, mm, good, that's going to upset the whole family. And so Paul's like, no, shut them up. You, you want to follow Jesus? Here's what you do to follow Jesus. You give your life to Jesus. You never add anything. See, this is not something new. People have constantly, from the beginning, tried to say, you, you have to add something. You don't have to add anything. You want to follow Jesus, give your life to Jesus and follow him. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. This is like when Nana doesn't realize that the filter is gone and the person she's talking about is six inches behind her, not 60 feet behind her, all right? Like you read these words and you're like, man, that's not politically correct. That wouldn't go over well today. And it's not, it's not politically correct. Like the, the filter here is gone, and, and I'm, we're just gonna we're just gonna be honest about it. This is this is a this is a hard saying that we have to encounter here. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, "Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons." In our society right now, everything offends everyone. We understand that. 
you're going to offend someone. It doesn't matter what you do. You're going to offend somebody. I, it's, it's gone a little overboard. There have been a lot of great things that have happened as a result, but yet society in a place right now is you can't say anything without somebody getting upset. And I don't know whether it's just because Paul's older in age or, or what the deal is here. He's, he just doesn't care. I mean, at that point, he goes, look at the Cretan, look at the Cretans. You're there in Crete. Look at what their own people said about them, that they're always liars. I mean, that's pretty harsh. You're always a liar. You're always an evil beast, and you're always a lazy glutton. In case you've been a little late on the Mother's Day card, you may not want to start with you're a liar, an evil beast, and a lazy glutton. Might not be the best Mother's Day of your life. And then Paul's like, that's what they say about themselves, and they're right. That's true. That's true. Now, I get that it's not politically correct, and yet we still stereotype. We still stereotype. Stereotype about Southerners, stereotype about Californians, stereotype about people from Michigan. Well, that one's true. But, you know, we have all of these... (laughs) We have all of these stereotypes, and, and we, we think, oh, well, it's not politically correct, and yet we still, we operate. They, they just change a little bit, and not always, but a lot of times, stereotypes come about because there have been instances where we have encountered people that, that make them true. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's just reality, and what is, why, why is he being so just so brutal here? And the answer is, he sees them as they are. And his desire is that they may be sound in the faith. To move them from there to over here. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And so what he's saying is, you have to choose. You have to choose. It's one or the other. What's your choice going to be? Do you choose to be somebody who's going to operate above reproach in your life? That when people look at you, they see no glaring habitual weaknesses. Do you choose to operate in life that you are going to put your family first? Do you choose to operate that you are not going to be a slave to money? Do you choose to operate that love exudes from you? Or do you choose to operate where life is all about you? and your consumption, and you look out only for yourself, that you won't cooperate with anybody, you won't listen to anybody, you are driven by you, and nothing else matters. You have to choose. It is one or the other. It's like when you're a little kid on a hot summer day, and you're running inside and then back outside, and you leave the laundry room door open, and then you run back inside, and you grab another popsicle, and you run back outside, and you leave that door open again, and your parents are just getting exasperated because they just opened the electric bill 10 minutes before this, and then they peek their head out, and they say, it's one or the other. You're inside or you're outside. Pick. That's what Paul's saying. As you pick, who are you going to be? Because a lot of times in life we think, I don't want to be a zealot. I don't want to, I don't want to be extreme. So there are a lot of great virtues that come with following Jesus. And yet, if we're being honest, there's some appeal of things that we can do when we don't follow Jesus. He's saying, no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. You're all in. Or you're all out. The choice is yours. They profess to be one thing, but their lives reveal that there's something else. But let me tell you the good news. I was never going to the NBA. I didn't have the skill. 
The great thing about following Jesus is it is available to everyone. The question is, will you make that choice? It didn't matter how many shots I took. It didn't matter how much I dribbled. It didn't matter how much Gatorade I drank. It didn't matter how many NBA games I watched and broke down. I am a six foot tall, slow white guy who doesn't shoot well. I'm not going to the NBA. But the promise of following Jesus is available to everyone. All the practice in the world wasn't going to make me a player. And yet following God can change your life. You might say, well, It's too late. I'm already defined. But with God, it's never too late. If you're not dead, the story of your life's not done. So you make the decision. What do you want to be? The choice is yours. Is it going to be all about you? All about your pleasure? All about your pursuits? All about what you want? Are you instead going to choose to follow Jesus and leave this world without a single regret? Because that's what he's offering us if we will choose for our lives to look more and more like him each and every day. God, I pray that we would be people who realize it's one way or the other, that we have a choice to make, and that we would choose you. And so God, let us be people who when others look at our lives, they see no glaring habitual weaknesses. Let us be people who love our our wives and our husbands, who love our kids, who put our families first. Let us be people who are not driven singularly by money. Help us be people who don't overreact. Help us be people who love. Help us be people who cooperate. Help us be people who dream big. And God, our prayer is that our lives would enable us to have a huge mission. that we could point other people to you and that their lives would be changed. So help us pick today who we're going to be. Not allowing the regret and the mistakes of our past to define us. But give us the strength to choose you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.